how much faster can gaming CPUs really get? Because lately, it seems like the progress has been really, really slow. While the rendering and encoding side of things is becoming absolutely unhinged, the gains when it comes to frame rate and gaming are far less inspiring. Well, let's see if the 7950X 3D can change that. AMD have taken the secret source from the 5800X 3D, which is that 3D vCache stacking, and added that here to Ryzen 7000 finally, five months after Ryzen 7000 has launched. So this time around, you'll actually have three 3D vCache chips to choose from, an eight core, a 12 core, and a 16 core model. That's the one that we're reviewing today. But very, very important, that 12 core and 16 core model don't actually get additional 3D cache over the 7800X 3D. It's not like the more cores you buy, the more stacked vCache you get, although that would be pretty cool. Instead, all three of these models here only have one of the two CCDs with that extra 64 megabytes of L3 cache. So I think we'd all agree it's the 7800X 3D which is looking like the better option out of the three. It's the cheapest for starters and you're kind of getting the most 3D enhancement for the money and also because with AMD's latest chipset driver you're only going to be gaming with the fastest eight cores anyway. So even if you buy the 12 or 16 core model those extra four to eight cores will literally be asleep when you're running a game. In fact I found the current public driver to already be doing this with the non 3D 79 50x. So look, we are kicking things off with the 16 core 7950x 3D today, but just keep that in mind. The new chipset driver disables the non 3D vCache CCD whenever it's under gaming loads. As for the test bench, I've tested all CPUs alongside an RTX 4090, more specifically the liquid cooled Supreme X from MSI. For DDR4 CPUs, I've used 3600C or 16, and for DDR5 parts, including Intel 12th and 13th gen, I've used 6000 megahertz C or 36. So let's kick things off with some competitive games first. These are usually the games where you'll see the most CPU scaling. And for these ones, I've also included the average latency on the left there as well. So PC latency, you can think of that as the processing latency of the CPU, GPU, and the game combined, but this doesn't include the latency of your mouse or your monitor. It's purely how fast your system can prepare and finish rendering a frame. Effectively, you can think of the right side of this graph showing the smoothness of the game and the left side showing the responsiveness. So here in Overwatch 2, to yeah, we do see the new Ryzen 7950X 3D right at the top of the chart. However, it is by a very slim margin. A good chunk of these CPUs are running into that 600 FPS cap, despite running these benchmarks at 1440p. Versus the 5800X 3D, inputs are one millisecond faster on average, and 1% lows are a mere seven FPS ahead. So barely a gain here at all. If though you're upgrading from a Ryzen 2000 or 3000 CPU, then you will definitely see a difference. Five millisecond second faster inputs and roughly a doubling in frame rate. However, that's also what you'd see if you were to upgrade to the 5800X 3D. In Modern Warfare 2, using the built-in benchmark, I actually found the 5800X 3D to be slightly faster on average compared to the new 7950X 3D. This is also something that I went back and retested, but I kept getting the same result. Very interesting to see for sure, and one more reason to hang on to that 5800X 3D if you currently have one. As for F122, despite running 1440p high settings here, the GPU usage for our RTX 4090 was only 83% when paired with the new 7950X 3D, so there is still some CPU bottlenecking at play. Having said that, everything from the 5800X 3D and upwards basically shows the same experience. Between the old and the new stuff, there's about a 3.5% improvement on average, and PC latency is basically identical. Maybe if we ran this at 1080p medium to low settings, we'd see some more aggressive scaling here, but not even the best sim racers in the world play with those settings. In Valorant, the 7950X 3D finally cracks that 1000 FPS mark on our spike plant simulation with 1% lows over 600 FPS. Again though, experience wise, there's basically no difference here versus the 5800X 3D, especially when the difference in latency is just half a millisecond, but for what it's worth, the 7950X 3D is the faster chip. Now keep in mind, if you're playing an actual 5v5 match, you'll see frame rates far below this, but the scaling for each CPU should be about the same. We also see surprisingly good scaling in 
Cyberpunk 2077. Here the new 3D chip was 5% faster on average versus the non-3D part and 13% faster when it came to the 1% lows. At this point as well, the new 7950X 3D almost relieves all CPU bottlenecking with these settings. GPU usage for our 4090 was 95% on average versus around 92% for the 5800X 3D. Now there are some instances where Intel's 13900K ends up on top of everything. In Red Dead Redemption 2 for example, I found the 5800X 3D and 7950X 3D to be virtually identical, but then the 13900K ends up 5% faster than both on average. Similar story in Doom Eternal, 13900K out on top, with the new and old 3D vCache chips basically pushing the same performance. So there are some instances, just as we saw with the 5800X 3D, where that extra L3 cache doesn't really help a lot. Then in Rainbow Six, even less convincing gains. Here the margin between the top five are incredibly slim, but maybe the biggest difference here out of all of these CPUs is power consumption. And surprisingly, the 7950X 3D doesn't pull that much power at all. In Valorant, just 76 watts, and that's also while pushing out 1000 FPS. Now, apart from the additional L3 cache, there are a few other differences here over the standard 7950X. The default temperature target has been lowered from 95 to 89 degrees C, and I will mention it hits that really, really easily. Despite using a 360mm cooler at 2000 RPM on an open bench, the 7950X 3D hit 89 degrees within just a couple of seconds of running Cinebench, and it did that while not even pulling 160 watts. So the heat management for this processor looks a little bit funky, if I'm honest. Those kind of numbers with a 360mm cooler just don't really add up. In particular, the CCD with the 3D vCache stacked on top was warming up extremely easy, and at least in this scenario, ran about 20 degrees hotter than the CCD that doesn't have that extra cache. So something is quite odd here, especially compared to the regular 7950X, which has pretty even temperatures across both CCDs. So more even heat distribution within the chip, a higher temperature target. As a result, the 7950X can sustain higher clock speeds and performance while under these all core workloads. So if you're looking for the most multi-threaded performance possible, and you're really serious about productivity and faster processing times, the standard 7950X is the slightly faster chip. In Cinebench, it was around 9% faster than the new 3D chip, which might hint at why AMD priced both products the same. Single threaded performance, on the other hand, is about equal since that heat and power management doesn't really come into play here. 3D motion tracking is a great example of that. This task only runs on a single thread. Oddly here though, I still found the regular chip to be a tiny bit faster. And then in Adobe Media Encoder, generating proxy files here for video editing, the 7950X 3D sits right alongside the 13900K and 7950X as you would expect. So for the most part, we are getting that Unreal 16 core Ryzen 7000 performance. It's only the full bore rendering and encoding stuff that seems to take about a 5 to 10% penalty versus the non 3D chip. That chip can boost a little bit higher and get a little bit warmer, so do expect more performance. All right, so the 7800X 3D is probably the one that you want to be waiting for here. To be honest, the 7950X 3D, it's a bit of a weird CPU. Like, I guess if you want the gaming benefits that the 3D vCache provides, but you also want 16 cores. I guess that's what this is trying to serve. But at the same time, you know, the gains that we're seeing, honestly, from the 3D vCache this time around, don't seem that impressive as what we saw with the 5800X 3D. And in most cases, the 5800X 3D is still there to play. Like if you currently are on the AM4 platform and you're looking for an upgrade, that chip is just an easy, easy pick. It's currently around $330, you know, just update your BIOS and drop it in your system. And there's no need to additionally purchase a new AM5 motherboard along with DDR5. So I am looking forward to seeing what that eight core variant can deliver, especially because these 3D chips are unlocked this time around. So potentially, so you could tweak them to the same clock speeds as what we have here, or maybe even faster. Now, one CPU that I didn't have in the charts for this one is the 13600K. For what it's worth, the gaming performance there is extremely similar to the 13900K. And if you are looking to build something from the ground up that's focused around gaming, that and the 5800X 3D are currently the two that I'd still be sticking with. But yeah, that's pretty much it. As always, a huge thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.